we're going to take a journey now a few hundred years into the past to the turn of the 16th um, um, uh, to the turn of the uh, 16th, 17th century, Galileo in northern Italy was turning his telescope up to the stars and uh, finding the moons of Jupiter and doing his best to annoy church authorities. <laughs> and meantime, up in Prague, a young astronomer, Johannes Kepler, um, was working at the court of the Holy em Roman Emperor Rudolf II and calculating the orbits and movements of the planets. Uh, Rudolf II happened to be an astrologer and an alchemist, and he really wanted accurate horoscopes, and that's why Kepler was actually there. And what Kepler did, we are taught today in our classes, in our science classes, that he discovered that planets move not in circular orbits, but in elliptical orbits with varying speeds, we know the laws that govern those planetary movements. This laid the foundation for Newtonian um, science that was to follow. But what is less known is that Kepler made his discoveries as a result of his study of music. Not the kind of music that you hear when you listen to heavy metal, which is full of discords and other things that made, make our ears kind of twist. I'm sorry, I'm showing my age here. But, um, but this was a harmonious music which the planets played as they orbited the sun. Now, it was at the court of Rudolf II that um, Kepler worked with uh, the... Um, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, who had assembled hundreds of observations of uh, um, the, many of the planets, very accurate observations. And as a result um, of that, um, Kepler was able to um, calculate very, very accurately the paths that the planets uh, um, followed. And this is what he found, actually, that the planets um, moved at varying speeds in elliptical orbits with the sun offset from the center. When the planet was closer to the sun, it moved faster. When it was further away from the sun, it moved slower. What did all this mean, Kepler wondered? Well, this is what he wrote. The eccentricities of individual planets originate in the prearranged plan of the harmonics between their orbits, which means that the planets all moved in ellipses that were predetermined by the music that they had to play. Now, the idea that planets generated a heavenly music as they orbited the sun is, was not a particularly new idea. It was 2,000 years old. Pythagoras came up with that idea because um, um, in the old um, school of Crotona, um, Pythagor um, the Pythagoreans already knew that any moving body generated a sound. So if the planets moved, then surely they generated a sound of some kind, a music. Now what the Pythagoreans also um, realized was that, um, was that there were certain laws that governed whether uh, two notes uh, con combined harmoniously or made a discord. And these were the laws of harmony. And any guitar player know these, knows these laws that if you actually um, put your finger on the string halfway down, you get an octave, two thirds you get a fifth, three uh, quarters you get a fourth. These are well-known musical chords where the strings combine and the sounds combine harmoniously as long as the harmonic proportions are simple. If they're complicated, like 10 elevenths or 12 thirteenths, you get a discord. But as long as the um, uh, proportions are simple, you do get a harmonious sound. Now, Kepler recognized, of course, that harmony is a uniquely human concept derived from our human perception. And he writes, it is from the soul that the harmonies of the configurations obtain their formal being. In other words, uh, um, um, our ability to distinguish 
Harmony from discord is not learned. It's inborn in us. And it is part of our heritage for being human. And it is also found out there in the universe, in the movements of the planets. And this is the music that he discovered. Now, can't tell you exactly all the mathematics, except that the planet's angular velocity was found proportional to the frequency of the notes that the planet generated. He decided that Saturn, at its furthest approach, um, um, would have the note G, and therefore Saturn played G, A, B, A, G, Jupiter an octave higher, Mercury, which had the most elliptical orbit, seven octaves higher than Saturn, and he found that it didn't all quite work. He was getting discords, so he adjusted the planetary parameters. He adjusted the distances, the velocities, so that he could get a perfect music. And these are the distances he found. The first two columns, um, furthest approach and the nearest approach of the planet in terms of the Earth's distance from the sun. And there are the modern values on the right. And you can see that the agreement as Fred Hoyle, our illustrious uh, British astronomer, said, the agreement is frighteningly good. Uh, uh, frightening because in terms of modern science, none of this makes sense. You know, modern astronomers don't believe in this kind of uh, music and, um, or these harmonies. So we're talking about something that really shouldn't make sense, and yet it does make sense. Lest you think that this actually... Um, is something which is unique to the first planets. Um, um, after Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were found, other astronomers went and they basically wrote the scale for the solar system, which is a harmonic minor scale, which is maybe why our world is a, kind of a doleful, sorrowful place. <laughs> now, similar harmonics are also found in the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and uh, extra solar planetary systems, about 20 light years away, 55 Cancri um, um, has several planets which are also there, uh, which also seem to have the um, harmonic relations. You find harmonic proportions in crystallography, not just astronomy. It's present in the anatomy of the human ear, in the superstring um, theory of elementary particles. Now, modern science embraces the, co the concept of harmony, symmetry, elegance, order. You'll find every scientist agreeing with this as long as no purpose, meaning, or metaphysics is implied. That's a very hard line that very few scientists are willing to cross. Now, I suggest our present approach where we deny the existence or purpose is a one-sided approach that leads to an incomplete view of the universe. We learn the how, but we don't know the why. As well as that, this view leads us to feeling alienated from the universe, a loss of connectivity between ourselves and the universe. Now, Kepler's universe is not separated from the observer, but intimately involved with him. The same harmonic proportion that we hear and to which we resonate is out there. It's out there in the motions of the planets, in the structure of crystals, and it may turn out if the superstring theory of uh, matter is turns out to be correct that we will find this harmony in the very heart of matter. And I leave you with Kepler's last thought, which is, so I throw the dice and write a book for my contemporaries or for posterity. I do not care, it may take a hundred years for my book to find readers, it took God 6,000 years to find an observer, probably more than 6,000 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.